Good evening, this is Viewpoint. I'm Zaka Jacob. A British Pakistani terrorist over the weekend takes four hostages in a synagogue in Texas. His only demand is that a fellow Pakistani terrorist who's been convicted and sentenced to 86 years in prison for plotting and attempting to kill US soldiers, that she be freed. After a 12 hour long operation by a special FBI team that was sent in from Quantico, the terrorist is neutralized and all the hostages are set free. One thing that this episode clearly shows is how the world is even today, even after 2611, even after the parliament attack, even after numerous attacks that have happened, which have originated in Pakistan with consequences for other countries, including India and Afghanistan, how the world continues to look the other way, not just because Pakistan is a state that sponsors terror, but today it is a state that makes a cause celebre out of terrorists, convicted terrorists like Afia Siddiqui. This was an act of terror. This was an act of terror, and it not only was uh, related to someone who had been arrested, I might add, 15 years ago and been in jail for 10 years. Make no mistake, not many people may know about Afia Siddiqui in the United States, but in Pakistan, this terrorist who's been convicted and sentenced to 86 years in prison is no less than a hero, is celebrated no less than a hero. Let me go across to our guests who are joining us. Uh, Professor Brahma Chalani, strategic affairs expert, is joining us. Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, former diplomat, is on the broadcast this evening. Left General retired Sanjay Kulkarni is also joining us in Viewpoint. And Jonah Blank is a former advisor to uh, President Joe Biden of the United States. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Brahma Chalani. In any other country, if there is a national from that country who is convicted of terrorism, and sent to prison for 86 years and another terrorist in her name and wanting her to be freed takes hostages, that country would not be tolerated in the global comity of nations. And yet Pakistan, it's not just what happened over the weekend. We've seen this over a number of years. Pakistan is being given a long rope by countries around the world, including the United States. Why and for how long more? That's a good question. But this jailed woman, Afia Siddiqui, has long been an icon in the international jihadist movement. Jihadist and terrorist groups have sought to free her, and so also the Pakistani state. At one time, Pakistan offered to release uh, Bawi Burgadil, who was being held captive by the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, Burgadil was a U.S. Army deserter, so Pakistan offered to secure the release of this uh, U.S. Army sergeant in exchange for the release of Afia, Afia Siddiqui. In other words, the Pakistani state itself has lent support to the, to the jihadist mission to free Afia Siddiqui. But to, coming to your question as to why the international community has not, uh, not uh, taken the necessary steps to bring Pakistan to heal. The, after all, the international community has enough leverage to force change in debt-ridden and dysfunctional Pakistan. If you look at the U.S., it has yet to strip Pakistan of its major non-NATO ally status or add that country to its list of yep. state sponsors of terrorism. The reason is simple. Pakistan remains a gatekeeper for America's geopolitical interests in Afghanistan. And there's a more important reason. We have seen how sponsoring cross-border terrorism pays. The Pakistani generals have managed to get their proxies installed in power in Kabul. So in a, in a way, Pakistan is effectively ruling yeah. Afghanistan. 
and sponsoring cross-border terrorism pays because Pakistan has always had a major power backing it and shielding its rogue actions. First it was the U.S. and now it is China. No, so I want to ask Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, uh, if after all this you have a situation where Afia Siddiqui, who is a woman who is convicted and sentenced, who, to whom the due process of law was accorded to, and then convicted and sentenced to 86 years in prison, is being celebrated like some kind of hero figure uh, in Pakistan, what does it say, not just about the Pakistani state, but sections within Pakistani society that are willing to make a cause celebre out of a convicted terrorist. Good evening, Zakar. The fact is that there are tens of thousands of madrasas in Pakistan which are radicalizing people. Red, red, radical Islam is becoming, is gaining strength, is uh, strengthening its chokehold over the society. This is a society where it, when the governor is shot dead by the bodyguard, the bodyguard is celebrated. And uh, uh, there, yeah. there are, you know, the problem is getting compounded by the fact that there are terror organizations. Terror organizations can be monitored. But what about sleeper cells? What about wolf, uh, lone wolves? Now, these are the people uh, who have been radicalized to the extent that they are willing to kill and die. Uh, Mr. Uh, Akram kept on saying that he wants a bullet in his head. And uh, there is no nothing, there was no red flag, uh, neither in Britain nor in the US. So what does it mean? It means that anybody, given the kind of, and by the way, the one of the former secretaries of state in, the, in Britain said about more than 10 years ago that 75% of the terror incidents in the world have a Pakistani DNA. Now the world knows what is happening in the neighborhood and yet chooses to turn the Nelson's eye. Yep. Uh, the U.S. keeps mollycoddling Pakistan. Uh, the U.S., I, all, I'm, I fail to understand why Pakistan is a blind spot in the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, it is absolutely inexplicable. The Pakistani perfidy has resulted in billions of dollars of loss, hundreds of American soldiers dead, and yet they look the other way. Now, I, I for one, do not understand what is going on and the fact is that till you call a terror by its name and these are what we see here are symptoms uh, the malaise is very much in pakistan mm -hmm. in the pol policy in the approach in what is happening in the society and there's only one way to do it is to drain okay. the swamp but who will drain the swamp is a billion dollar question I, I want to also ask Lieutenant General Kulkarni, I mean, look at the sequence of events. You have one convicted terrorist uh, who uh, w was caught uh, in the United States for terrorist activities. You know, one of the charges against her was to try uh, that she tried to plot and kill U.S. soldiers on foreign soil. While she was being taken for interrogation, she tries to snatch an M5 rifle and kill U.S. soldiers who were taking her for interrogation. She's charged with and convicted for that as well and this person is being celebrated as some kind of a hero figure in Pakistan and neither the United States nor the Global Committee of Nations leave aside the billions of dollars that have been swindled in the name uh, of the war on terror but now that the real game has been exposed with the Taliban taking over Kabul and the ISI and the Pakistani state becoming active participants in the takeover of Kabul, why is the U.S. still treating Pakistan with such kid gloves? Absolutely mind-boggling, mind-boggling. When you look at it, Apia, prisoner number 650, number of people killed to get a, a, a arrest out of the prison for 86 years, 57 people so far killed. Who is she? Daughter of the nation, declared by whom? by the Senate of Pakistan, who stands in her support, Imran Khan, who speaks of what? Islamophobia, supports the jihadist movement. Who is she married to? The mastermind of 9-11, Khalid bin Khalid. Now, that's the kind of background this lady has. And she's been caught with thousands of dollars for what? Acquiring 
night vision devices, military equipment, military manuals. What is all this? And if the entire nation of Pakistan, which has Jinnah as the father of the nation, and this girl Apia as the daughter of the nation, can you imagine a nation that breeds terrorism, a nation which stands, it uses terrorism as an instrument of state policy. The entire world knows that Pakistan is the hub of terrorism. As you rightly said, more than 75 to 80 percent terrorists that are, are operating from Pakistan are ex-Pakistani. Pakistan takes out a new security policy. What is it doing? It's breeding radicalization. It has radicalized the entire society. It raises Taliban. It has Haqqani network working in Afghanistan. The entire world knows. But it's surprisingly, we are in a catch-22 situation where China intends to support Pakistan because at one point of time, the United States supported Pakistan to have who have a foothold in China and talks that they facilitated with Mao Zedong and Sean Lai. This is the way I think the world must realize that Pakistan is the hub of terrorism, that Pakistan must be federalized. There's no question of celebrating or wanting a release for in Pakistan or for that matter anywhere in the world. I think it's time we realize what is going on. But the world seems to have just ignored Pakistan okay. and you look at the way. Do you see the mention of the United States in their new security policy? Nothing. You just see their name where they mentioned in absolutely other states. That's the kind of relationship that is developed. I, and I, now, Zaka, just I, a second. I also Can you want imagine? to ask uh, Jonah, Jonah Blank. Uh, uh, Kamar Shima is also joining us on the broadcast. Before I go to Kamar Shima, though, I want to go to Jonah Blank. And, and, I, and I think viewers around the world, particularly viewers in India, who have seen these uh, these episodes, including the one that we saw over the weekend in, in Texas, close to Fort Worth, are, are baffled by, you know, this this long rope. Yes, every time Amer American officials are asked this, particularly under in, under this president, uh, they say, oh, there's been no contact whatsoever at the highest level. There's been no, not even a phone call between Joe Biden and, and Imran Khan. But that doesn't mean much. That's just optics. Uh, that's just for, you know, domestic <coughs> consumption, as it were. The reality, the nuts and bolts, is what Professor Brahmachalani said a moment ago. Pakistan continues to be a major non-NATO ally. There are even today billions of military and non-military aid that flows into Pakistan. And if after the role of Pakistan, the active connivance of Pakistan in bringing back the Taliban in Kabul has not laid bare its intentions and its activities, then I doubt what will. So, Jonah Blank, please explain to our viewers why such a long rope? Uh, well, thank you for having me on. Uh, first, I would I would like to uh, agree with uh, several of your guests. Uh, Professor Chalani and the ambassador are both absolutely right about uh, the the fact that uh, out and out terrorists are public heroes in Pakistan. Uh, frankly, I'm less surprised uh, that uh, Fia Siddiqui is a hero as a heroine than that uh, Hafiz Saeed and um, Mohammed Azhar are uh, are public heroes when they're 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 acknowledged and much uh, prided. Uh, history of terrorism goes far, far greater, and of course, India is uh, has been the primary target of uh, both of them. Uh, so I think that uh, that piece of it is one that I entirely agree with. Uh, the question really becomes naughty in terms of what does one do about it, because the uh, aid from the U.S. to Pakistan has largely been shut off. Uh, that pipeline was flowing throughout the Afghan war, and it was, quite frankly, a largely a transactional pipeline. And at this point, it really becomes a question of what does one do? After all, India itself has not severed diplomatic relations with Pakistan, and India has been a far, um, far more of a victim of Pakistan's terrorism than anyone else. Okay, uh, so Kamar Chima, I'll, I'll come, there are two parts. Uh, I'll come to the first part, uh, and, and please explain to our to our viewers how a uh, a person named Lady Al Qaeda, who was caught with, uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars night vision goggles. Uh, arrested, convicted, sentenced to 86 years in prison. Uh, she resurfaces in Afghanistan, tries to kill U.S. soldiers, both in Afghanistan as well as in continental United States. The due process of law is meted out to her, and she's convicted 
and sentenced to 86 years in prison as a convicted terrorist. How can this person be celebrated as a hero figure in your country, sir? Well, I think uh, this is not just a matter of the Afia Sadiqi. The entire generation uh, was raised with these kind of slogans that uh, what uh, jihad means for them. Uh, so obviously, uh, the state and uh, the groups uh, fail to make the public understand uh, that jihad is the only responsibility or waging a war is the only responsibility of the military or the state, not the individuals. But uh, uh, including Afia Sadiqi, there are many people, there are men and women around the world, the Muslims who really believe that they should go for jihad and such kind of a generation have been involved in that. But I think at the same time, the right-wing Islamic elements and the conservative politicians try to cash in these phrases like daughter of the nation uh, and calling Afia Sadiqi as if she represents uh, uh, or she is a daughter of the country. But obviously, the government of Pakistan um, and the Pakistani military and the law enforcement agencies, we understand that the nation has paid thousands of uh, lives in the war against terrorism and those people who will wage jihad individually, they are not the friends no, of no, Pakistan Mr. and Mr. they are Mr. not Chima, doing service to Islam. You, 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 your, they are the your, enemies your of Islam in Pakistan. Your answer tends to give the impression that, they tends to give the impression that you know, the Pakistani state is helpless or the, I mean, uh, there are certain sections which are celebrating this person as a, as a hero figure. That's not the case. The very prime minister of the country called her daughter of the nation. A sitting elected what? prime minister calling a convicted terrorist daughter of the nation. Doesn't that sound absolutely appalling to you? Well, I think uh, uh, one cannot call her the daughter of the nation, but because uh, the right-wing sentiments and the public sentiments are so much, because there has been anti-Americanism in Pakistan for long, and particularly the, when the Americans waged this war in Afghanistan and General Musharraf was in office. So many, including Imran Khan, openly said that this is not our war, this is America's war. So Pakistan, a lot, a lot number of people were not happy with Pakistan's decision uh, to go with the America uh, in fighting war against terrorism. So that is why to win over the sentiments and win to win over the uh, the right wing masses, uh, many people just go and help uh, and just uh, raise their voice along with the general public in this anti-Americanism and they blame that the Afia Siddiqui was there. But I think uh, what, what is Anti-Americanism is one thing, but to but to make a hero figure out of a convicted terrorist is something entirely different. It's it's not the same thing. Anti-Americanism can't be equated with making a cause celebre out of a convicted terrorist. But I'll give the final word to Brahma Chalani. I want to take this forward. And, and you're right. You know what the U.S. did by patronizing Pakistan through the 70s and 80s and much of, of course, uh, the last 20 years of the war on terror. Today, Pakistan does not need the U.S. as a patron. It's got a, a, an equally big and important patron in China. What is it that the world can do about that? Yes, there, is, there are fault lines in China itself, some of which emanate from Pakistan. There are certain uh, you know, uh, terrorist organizations uh, which China feels is detrimental to its interests, not just to projects in Pakistan, but also uh, in Xinjiang. How can these fault lines be used to put pressure on China because that seems to be the only country, if at all, uh, you know, having some kind of leverage with Pakistan. You're absolutely right. Over the years, the footprints of many terrorist attacks in the West and India have been traced to Pakistan. In addition, the U.S. found bin Laden near the Pakistan Military Academy. Are the terrorist leaders captured since 9-11? Well, again, found ensconced in Pakistan, including Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Al-Qaeda's third in command, and Abu Zubeda, the network's uh, operations chief, the uh, Al-Qaeda operations chief. They were all found living comfortably in Pakistan's heartland. But coming to um, okay. uh, the latest hostage-taking incident, this wouldn't have happened had the Pakistani state not emboldened the hostage taker. You know, by calling Afia Siddiqui, daughter of the nation, turning her into a national icon, the Pakistani state encouraged this latest terrorist incident. But to answer your question, 
the battle against international terrorism cannot be won unless the nexus between terrorist groups and Pakistan's military establishment is severed. To severe that nexus, the civil military relations in Pakistan need to be rebalanced. Right now, the military intelligence and nuclear establishment are not answerable to the civilian government. They are a state within the yeah. state. The only way to break the Pakistani military general's vice-like grip on power is to subordinate the military intelligence and nuclear establishments to the elected government. Unless that rebalancing of civil and military relations happens in Pakistan, Pakistan will be not at peace with itself right. or with its neighbors. Okay, we'll leave it at that. I want to thank all our guests, but uh, this is a related story and of uh, equal concern to uh, all countries around this region, particularly here in India. Uh, as we thank our guests, there's been a series of explosions that have happened at the Abu Dhabi International Airport. We can now confirm to you that three individuals have died, which includes two Indian nationals. Uh, the Indian mission in the UAE has sent an emergency team to the airport to try and ascertain the identity of these two individuals. Uh, we do know that they are Indian citizens, two out of the three who have died, but we don't know what their identity is, where they were from in India, were they employees at the airport or were they other individuals or were they passengers uh, who were passing by uh, the Abu Dhabi International Airport. Uh, what was uh, said was there were multiple small flying objects that were seen uh, in the vicinity of the Abu Dhabi International Airport and inside there were also reportedly explosions of fuel tankers that happened inside the airport. Houthi rebels uh, who are fighting in Yemen have claimed responsibility for this attack. Maha Siddiqui has more details on this. Uh, Maha, is there any further word from the Indian mission in the UAE as to who these two individuals were? Uh, the Indian nationals who have been killed, were they employees at the airport? Were they, were they passengers who were using that airport? Do we have any further details? They haven't uh, given any further details, Zaka. At the moment, all they are saying is that they are in touch with the UAE authorities for further details on these two individuals. But uh, they are ascertaining the fact the uh, UAE authorities have in fact uh, told the Indian side that uh, out of the three casualties, two were of Indians. Now, since this was a construction site where one of the uh, one of the accidents happened because of the drone attack that was uh, uh, done by the Houthis. Uh, we are assuming that these people could be one of uh, or two of those who were employed there. Uh, six others have been injured, Zaka. So since this was a place probably where uh, Indians, Pakistanis were employed uh, for work, we will have to wait to see whether out of those six who are injured as well, whether there are any Indians, because they would need assistance as well. There is no word on that as of now. But uh, the Indian side mission in the UAE has already put out uh, on Twitter that they have been informed by UAE authorities that two of the casualties are Indians and they are ascertaining further details. <coughs> All right. Uh, what is worrisome about this attack is it, if, if confirmed, this would be the first time that a major terrorist organization in this wider region has shown the ability to carry out drone attacks uh, on a major international uh, airport. We'll, we'll see how the story plays out and what the consequences uh, therein are uh, for wider geopolitics in the Middle East. That's a wrap. I'll catch you again at 9 o'clock with Brastax. On the other side, Shivani will be joining you.